Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of This is Revolution Podcast. And let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog, right away, Mr. Pascal Robert. And greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles, with the yellow microphone. Yes. Um, as the show is growing, I was able to afford some 25 cent uh, pop screens for the microphone. So now I can have a pop screen at both computer setups so I don't have to keep forgetting the, the microphone pop screen as I do the edits for the video. So there you go. And I'll have a different color for every show. Take that. It's, it's, That's moving on. That's what progress looks like. It's fantabulous. I don't have a hat on. And coming all the way live from the great state of Missouri. He's a professor. He's a friend of show. He, like my co-host, has just been all over the podcast sphere gallivanting. That's what Pascal and this gentleman do. Me, Jean Bajlan. Greetings, everybody. Greetings, Jason. Greetings, Pascal. It is a pleasure to be here this evening, and I'm super excited for our guest. Jean Bajlan. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm excited, too, because I worked not as hardcore, but I definitely was in that world probably more than I wanted to be in reading that book. Uh, was a lot of <laughs> that is so true, uh, especially when he talked about sleep pods. Sleep pods was my favorite. I wish you would have went to a few other places because uh, some of the offices I went to had music rooms, and we'll probably we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that in a little bit. Before we bring in our guest, let's play the intro video. Since Wall Street started using computers, volume on the big board doubled and redoubled to as much as 70 million shares a day. The government certainly uses computers. When you pay your taxes, IRS computers will audit the returns. The federal government also uses computers to track down runaway husbands on welfare. And now the Reagan administration wants to cut down the number of welfare cheats by putting a computer cross-check on everyone who gets government help. That's going too far, says the American Civil Liberties Union. But for the most part, computers have become such a way of life that many people believe they don't invade their privacy. That's because in America today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is inevitably linked to a computer. Though there was much sheer rascality in the Wall Street of the 1920s, much sheer greed roaming at large, and a widespread betrayal of the fiduciary principle. It may be that none of these things did as much damage to the country in the sum total as the sheer irresponsibility of men who, possessing vast powers, played the game of profit and loss without regard for the general public interest. This quote from Frederick Lewis Allen's 1935 book, Lords of Creation, are prescient words that still ring true when we speak of the new oligarchical elite in Silicon Valley, running roughshod over regulations and labor rights like their turn-of-the-century predecessors. Is the Silicon Valley Tech 1% truly the benevolent creators of technology that will lead us to a new, better, smarter, more efficient world? Or is their libertarian vision of progress just a dystopian nightmare? We'll discuss this and more. This is Revolution. Well, Americans have always celebrated their capitalist heroes. And uh, that started with the Industrial Revolution, the early, the early factories of Lowell and so on. The Where you had, like here, writers and artists going, it was with this, the same kind of utopian vision of how this was going to recreate an egalitarian and wonderful world. Yeah, think of the railroad, think of Edison, think of Henry Ford and the automobile industry. We've done this over and over, and it, it includes not only the celebration of the technology, because Americans more than any other people just adore any new technology we also adore the kind of great successful capitalists we lionize them you think of 
you're of our Ford and brave new world. And we did the same thing with Steve Jobs, for example, re uh, recently. And then we add that kind of utopian element that this is going to save the world, this is going to change the world for the better. We are the ultimate modernist, uh, looking to the future and not paying too much attention to the present and the problems of the present. The dual ability that man has. And I think that the, uh, after this process has come to maturity, the effects that it's going to have on society are actually going to far outstrip even those that the petrochemical revolution has had. But these computers are not necessarily simply innocent playthings of the future. Some people feel threatened by them. Some think they tend to dehumanize, and others fear they may eventually take over their jobs. So, without any further ado, I'm sure you guys are all excited. An older episode of this gentleman of the Michael Brooks show was on earlier today. Coincidentally enough, Mr. Corey Pine. Hey, guys. Journalist extraordinaire, author. Yep. <sighs> There's a lot of things you do. Authoring That's most of it. You do well. <laughs> Look, you you wrote a book called uh, was, it, "Was it Live, Work, Work, Die"? Uh, one extra word: Live, Work, 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 Die. Oh, there's three works. Yeah. There is a lot of work in the in what these cats do. In in, you actually went. Would you say undercover? You know, I get that a lot. I, I would not say undercover. Uh, I told everybody that I was um, when I was doing my reporting in Silicon Valley that I was working on a book, but I also told them I was doing a startup. So uh, they would kind of be more, nobody was really interested in the book or, or anything that I wrote. So, you know, they, they just figured that it wasn't that interesting because you had to read it. I didn't find a lot of readers in my, in my reporting, you know. There isn't a lot of readers in that world, right? They want, can you give it to me quick? Exactly. The elevator pitch. So a book is just something that's kind of out of their universe in a way. That's for my barista to do. <laughs> or something you put on your shelf to look like you've got interests, you know. As much as we joke about that in this podcast world, there's people that, that always do their show behind this wall of books that they allegedly read. That is definitely a world with a bunch of books that you know people haven't read, but they have around. Rand is one of them because Teal is such a big presence in that world. I think that's kind of funny. Corey, I wanted to ask you a question, not only about your book, but about your research going stealth in Silicon Valley. In, in the recent uh, election period that we had in November 2020, we saw a lot of discussion about the tech world becoming agents of censorship with the way they were handling political discourse, particularly around Donald Trump, and how people accused them of ideologically picking favorites in terms of they, the way in which they were handling media. You saw a lot of people on the right wing side of the political aisle talking about how the IT world were in bed with the Democrats and the liberals and so on. Based on your, ex, your experience and based on your book as well, how would you describe the politics of the uh, tech magnates, if you will. What is their worldview? Some people have accused them of being really libertarians on many issues. How would you describe the way in which they actually view the world, politics, and governance as an industry, if a statement can be made overall? Well, I think they run on a spectrum, really, at the top of the industry from uh, libertarian Democrats on the left side to uh, outright fascists on the right. Uh, usually with a futuristic sort of bent like the the fascists of the 20s uh, 1920s um, very very easy to trace a lineage there I don't think there are a lot of or any despite what the Republicans um, in the US say I don't think there are really any left-wing tech CEOs out there uh, it's just not it's just not something that um, that is is uh, a feature you know many of them have, have what you might call left-wing social views. You know, they're they're pro 
uh, gay marriage and pro-drug legalization and things like that. They might even support um, redistributive programs like a universal basic income. But I think you'll find that a lot of those leftish positions uh, that tech executives have are, are really libertarian positions at the end of the day. And even if they support Democrats electorally, they're, they tend to be libertarian in outlook. Now, when you say they have fascist poss possibilities similar to the 1920s, do you mean almost kind of like fascist to the point of like anti-Semitic or anti-certain ethnic groups? How would you relate them? Now, that's a good question because very, uh, very rarely do you see um, overt uh, obvious uh, racism or bigotry of that nature among the tech fascists. Uh, they tend to hedge things in scientific in terms of scientific racism. So, you know, they'd be believers in, you know, racial disparities in intelligence and things like that. Heavy um, on IQ and heavy on eugenics. Yeah, big into eugenics. I mean, there's a lot of admirers of, um, uh, I guess, the uh, the Chinese um, approach. Some of them think that the, the Chinese are, are biologically superior to white people and that they're, uh, you know, incipient eugenics programs, genetic engineering type programs that are happening in China are something that need to be emulated in the U.S. So, I, you know, do they come out and wave um, their, you know, fascist flags and stuff um, as you know, business executives in Silicon Valley, no, but they've certainly created an environment for that kind of street fascism to thrive, uh, you know, through their their sort of libertarian idea of, of free speech and, uh, you know, letting uh, their, their sort of algorithmic uh, selection of speech so that, you know, uh, suddenly 20 years ago, um, you know, I don't think Holocaust denial for example, was quite where it's at today, but today you can find it on the first page of Google results. Uh, and, you know, that's not an accident. These things, this, the libertarian outlook sort of creates a space for the, the fascism uh, at a lower level. And at the higher level, I do think there are, there are out, outright fascists, but they're a bit, uh, Peter Thiel is somebody I would consider. Ooh, that was my cat. <laughs> Oh, your cat knocked over your computer? My cat just went nuts, yeah. Uh, he likes to... Is my mic still working on everything? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, that's good. Uh, Peter Thiel, um, the Facebook board member, uh, PayPal founder, now venture capitalist, is somebody who I, I'm pretty comfortable calling a fascist. Um, but, you know, he certainly wouldn't identify that way. He would, he would call himself a libertarian or a, a reactionary, he's described himself as. You talk about Peter Thiel uh, in the book, specifically in the second half of the book. Could you elaborate for our audience a little bit about the kind of networks that Peter Thiel is involved in funding and sort of how things relate to him in, in, in terms of his sort of attempt to engage in the political process? Thiel, uh, I mean, he would say that he gives to a, a variety of causes, and that's true. But also for years, he's been uh, maybe the most important funder of a, a faction of the alt-right that I called, or that they called neo-reactionaries. Um, and an example, uh, he's, he's uh, been a patron of a number of characters I describe in my book. One is a guy named uh, Curtis Yarvin, who goes by the online pseudonym Mencius Moldbug. Who had a blog that was uh, became pretty popular in Silicon Valley and beyond that, where he uh, praised um, or at least uh, condoned some of the activities of people like Anders Breivik, the uh, the Oslo mass murderer, neo-Nazi, and uh, gave a lot of uh, long-winded sort of pseudo scholarly. Uh, defenses of scientific racism and uh, pr promoted an idea of a, that Peter Thiel is quite fond of called, uh, I forget the exact phrasing, but the idea is that you'd have, uh, instead of a United States, you'd have a thousand different corporate states, uh, basically corporate fiefdoms where people would be free to move between. So if you didn't like living in Microsoft land, you could go live in 
Facebook land or uh, what have you. Um, that's kind of the, the, the neo-reactionary ideology. Uh, but also he funded people who uh, trended into outright fascism in the, <clears throat> but sort of from the transhumanist point of view. I don't know if you're familiar with transhumanism, but it's it's an idea cyborgs. that we're, what's that? Where we become cyborgs. Yeah, basically the idea is that we're we're merging with machines and we're on the cusp of some kind of evolutionary transition into a uh, cybernetic future. Uh, that that's an idea that animates a lot of uh, tech well, isn't CEOs. That, isn't that why that movie Ex Machina was such a like it was almost like porn for a, a certain class of people in uh, Silicon Valley? If you remember that film from uh, four or five years ago. Yeah, that, I mean that's sort of like. I didn't see that movie, but I because I kind of got the idea that it was um, a little bit promoting that that idea rather than being critical yeah. of it. Although, yeah, I, I Elon, Elon Musk is is big on this stuff. The whole yeah. uh, connecting the the human brain to uh, some kind of like a computerized digital, you know, uh, mach- you know, chips or something of that nature. Yeah, I get into that in the book. Um, they're all kind of believers in this thing called the singularity, which yeah. uh, is is similar. It's this idea that we're merging with computers, and eventually, the um, you know the the computers will eclipse us and will will take over the universe as some kind of digital consciousness. It's pretty far out stuff. I think it's I think it's quite far fetched and not likely to happen. But I think it's pretty telling that. Uh, the tech CEOs, uh, some of the some of the billionaire oligarchs that are running our world are, are really enraptured by these ideas, um, out of science fiction, really, that they find, if not immediately feasible, something they want to build toward. Uh, and so, if you interrogate like what kind of society we would have in those scenarios, that's where the fascism sort of uh, emerges, because it, it's usually. Uh, a, you know, a tech oligarch <laughs> calling all the shots and, and not really a, a sort of democratic or pluralistic society that we might want to build. So, so, so what you're saying is that these these tech oligarchs present a type of fascism that's even distinct from the kind of banality of the traditional right wing Trumpian manifestation that we see everyone worried about right now. I think it is distinct. I mean, you saw Peter Thiel supporting Trump. He was one of the most important. You know, he spoke for, on his behalf at the Republican National Convention back in 2016. There were some reports that he he kind of soured on Trump later, but I mean, they do align on a lot of important issues. I mean, I think the racism is one. Uh, the you know the 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 business above all is another. Uh, you know, the idea that corporations should really be calling the shots. I think uh, pledge of allegiance in that world too. The business above all almost feels like a pledge of allegiance. I said in that world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but there's not. There's other things that they're not really comfortable with. The sort of Trump, more Trumpian uh, fascist movement in the country. They're not really comfortable with some of the the social aspects of it. I guess so. Uh, I think you would have to consider it distinct. But they they do work together. And ultimately, I think you know the the. The techie fascist uh, tendency is a bit scarier because it tricks a lot more people into thinking it's more benign. Well, it's it's, it's almost as if that they, they've like seen Blade Runner, or they've read you know uh, some of the classics of cyberpunk. But instead of seeing it as a dystopia, they see it as a blueprint for the future. They've like inverted what we used to think of as in the past as kind of like a terrifying dystopian future, and are trying to present it as something positive almost. Well, didn't Peter Thiel say in an interview, and I remember Megan Day wrote about this a while back, that uh, he, his take on Star Wars, that it was it was a pro-capitalism movie, all because of the character of Han Solo. I was going to bring that up. I mean, he, that's they love to argue about science fiction and stuff, and, and Thiel is definitely a Star Wars person, not a Star Trek person. He thinks Star Trek is socialist propaganda. I mean, I guess you could you could make that case, but uh, you know it's a little more colonial than, than <laughs> socialist in a lot of ways. But uh, but anyway, yeah, they they actually embrace a lot of the villains, the classic villains of science fiction, and I think they're they're worth emulating. I was, I was, I was just, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you were what? 
Oh, I just, we watched uh, Blade Runner on Netflix last night and it had been a long time since I saw it. And, you know, one of the, the villain is like this corporate overlord on Mars. And I thought this is like exactly what Elon Musk wants to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? He won't watch, like those guys won't watch Blade Runner though. That's what's so funny. Like I, I, I got to be in a room. There's a, there was a Facebook conference um, that was for marketing only, but they don't, they don't uh, advertise it as a Facebook conference. And I got to work at one of those dumbass jobs I was telling you about. And I got to be in a room uh, where I had to sign a non-disclosure uh, and listen to Peter Thiel talk and captivate an entire pretty big conference room uh, or convention room full of uh, aspiring uh, uh, sales Boot people. Lickers. <laughs> Boot lickers. Yeah. Aspiring. <laughs> well, that's actually, that actually is what I wanted to ask is like, how far does this ideology run down? Like, how what what kind of buy-in is that, Corey, for this this kind of techno hell utopia ideology? Do people in the business just go along with it? Is that like amongst the proles, amongst the kind of programmers? You know, I would assume there's more ideological diversity, but you know, obviously, this how hegemonic is this ideology? I think it's really strong among people who see themselves as entrepreneurs and want to be, you know their own uh, CEO of their own startup, founder of their own startup, and emulate the, the oligarchs, uh, less so among the rank and file. You know, since I wrote and published the book, there's been like a lot of uh, labor organizing in the tech sector, which um, to, to an extent that I might have thought impossible when I started yeah. my reporting. And I think it's it's been great to see that. So I think the ideology is uh, it, ha- it has a lot of buy-in, you know, prob- I would say if I had to estimate, I would say probably half of the people that work in tech are on some level bought in to, uh, the, if not the tech fascist ideology, the, the adjacents of it and some of the prerequisites of it. You, know? you don't think they're really- definitely okay with the idea of corporations running things, for instance. You don't think that's a conservative estimate? Um, well, I just saw the, the reason I said 50% is I just saw a poll the other day that was like something like, I think it was 50% of tech workers, maybe more were interested in joining union, um, hmm. which indicates That's to me nice. some skepticism about the, the package of ideologies that their, their employers are kind of selling them, you know? So have you had a resp- have you had a response from people working in the tech uh, sector who've read your book? You know, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Most of them find a lot uh, fam- familiar, <laughs> familiar uh, anecdotes and things like that in what I put in. Um, I don't hear from a lot of people that work in tech and hated the book, but I do hear from a lot of people that it resonated with. Um, is, is there a strong sense of the "we've got an app for that" attitude towards? <laughs> overall large problems. I find that consistently when I when I, I interface with people who work in like the IT world at executive level, that they have this really like kind of condescending like, oh well we can just develop an app for that kind of uh worldview for like any and every type of problem. Yeah, it's it- it's really frustrating. <laughs> it's really frustrating because I mean that's that's something that even the people who are maybe pro union or more left wing in their outlook who work in tech often tend to buy into is the idea that they can innovate their way out of problems. And I just don't think that everything's solvable that way. I, I think that's that's pretty common in that industry for sure. But would you agree it's even deeper than we've got an app for that? I, I would even add on to the fact that it's like, well, if I create this thing and make my gajillions of dollars, then I can give money to said charity or start said foundation, and then I'll change the world. Uh, Anon Girdadas writes a lot about it in his book uh, "Winner Take All." I don't know if you if you read or, or enjoyed that book, but there were definitely aspects of it that I really did did kind of agree with. Because again, being in that room with people like Peter Thiel for two days straight, and you hear the way they talk, it is like you know once you get your nest egg of your first billion, then you can go into your philanthropic Bill Gates like efforts because to a lot of these people they don't see the 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 bad of bill gates all they know about bill and melinda gates is that he wants to cure malaria 
Yeah, I think it's even I think it's even deeper. I think it's something that's like very American in a way. The idea that you know you can get yours and then and then solve the problem through innovation or through wealth, <laughs> you know. Um, and in some ways, Silicon Valley I think is like the 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 new. Uh, so it sounds a little cliche, but it's you know the new frontier of American capitalism. You know, so you see a lot of old older sort of uh, value sets and assumptions about how things work sort of reinterpreted through the, the tech industry. Do you think that, uh, do, I mean, do you think that there's any kind of room for any kind of oppositional or left politics in this space? Are they so subsumed with the hegemony of corporate power and of capital that the notion of having a public goods governance or even wealth redistribution is just absolutely anathema to anything they consider. I think if if there is hope for that, I, it'll come from the kind of work we're organizing that's been happening at, at the big tech companies. Um, it'll come from the bottom, in other words, because I, I don't think the boardrooms and the executive suites are are really interested in fundamentally changing the way that they operate um which is which is what you need to see happen if if tech were to be if we if i think even beyond that i mean i think the way that we think about tech now in our society is it, from a completely corporate centered capitalist viewpoint and we need to think about it as more of a a, a tool that we can choose how to use as a society rather than having these companies constantly rolling out new products, new innovations and new labor abuses in the guise of apps and gig work opportunities and things like that, that are just foisted on us. I don't one know if that answers that, your question, but. One of the things that really comes across uh, in your book uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like for a lot of Silicon Valley startups, they're either fraud, like out and out fraud, or they are premised on illegality. To what extent, and that sort of speaks to a kind of broader point that, you know, a lot of people talk about innovation in, in Silicon Valley, but how much innovation is going on and how much is, it, it strikes me, Silicon Valley is sucking up the sort of intellectual capacity of the United uh, States, you know, people who could be doing very important technical projects and wasting their talents on making a dating app for, you know, people with dogs or, or, or you know, like basically driving people into what is in a sense, either criminality, something that is entirely, uh, you know, useless uh, or but might make a short profit or is just fraud and is wasting them it's actually stifling innovation i think a hundred percent uh the latter of, of what you're saying i mean it is crushing innovation these companies i mean start with how especially the largest companies behave and treat treat actual innovative products they buy, they tend to acquire the smaller companies that innovate and then shut them down or you know absorb them and then shut them down uh, that's so common. It's been happening, you know, since the '90s, if not earlier, uh, with Microsoft, now Google, Facebook. Um, huge part of the only way they can grow now, in many ways, is to hire, uh, acquire smaller companies. Uh, and usually, the I've been through this myself at a job I had, um, where you know, if a smaller company innovates in some way and poses a threat to the larger company, they acquire it and and basically make it disappear. So that's for all they talk about innovation. I mean, that's just a standard practice of the industry, which goes against even their own conception of what's innovative. Um, as far as like the real groundbreaking kind of technologies and things that, you know, um, you might like to see more of in our society uh, or even consumer products like the iPhone, all that stuff is government research backed. I mean, sometimes the research goes back two or three decades before it reaches the consumer market. But the biggest innovations still to this day come from government funded research, uh, the university, public university systems, uh, the national laboratories, 
military research is a huge one and Silicon Valley is really tight um, with the military industrial complex or part of it, I should say. So, you know, there's a lot of myths that uh, the tech industry is promoted about innovation and, and what makes it happen. Uh, but the reality is it's, it's government research, it's government money um, that drives the big innovation. And, you know, I think we need to really get our acts together as far as how we allow that to be used. It's been the government's practice and priority for, for many decades now that once, you know, government research is, has reached maturity, then it goes to the private sector so people can make a profit on it. And that that has basically created the Silicon Valley we see today, which is totally predatory capitalist in nature. Well, and doesn't yeah, the benefits aren't shared widely. So I wanted to ask you about that. So a lot of times when these things are rolled out, right? Like one thing about that world, and and I have, again, I haven't finished your book, and maybe you do talk about this in your book, and, and I apologize <laughs> for not finishing your book in two That's days. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not offended. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, the first thing I noticed when I walked into when I was like, finally, I got a badge. You know how it is when you get a badge, like you're a guy that can go in and out of the building without someone escorting you in and out of a building. Um, was that there was such a disconnect with people that did work that we, we, we always hear this almost Horatio Alger esque story of starting from the ground up. Right. And, and one day you'll get the corner office. Um, and that seems to be kind of done in this new world. Like you're, you, how many people really move up? And there's a huge, like the people that serve your food are a third party. The people that handle your mail are a third party. Sometimes even the programmers that you're dealing with, depending on what they're doing, are a third party. The security is a third party. Like there's a small handful of people that are actually employed by said company and then there's all these third parties, all these people that will never move up. And I feel like the third party people are all vying for that spot to move up. So when you talk about like predatory capitalism, it's like people don't even give a damn that the people <laughs> that are serving their food, cleaning the building, protecting said building, i.e. security, are all extremely uh, underpaid uh, third party personnel. I, I did see, uh, I mean, I think generally speaking, you're absolutely right. I did see when there was um, an organizing campaign recently at, at Google or somewhere like that, uh, you know, the tech workers who are organizing made a point to speak up for the, the tech party <coughs> contractors who are being mistreated at the same company. So I think that there might be a growing awareness of that, but there is still kind of this, this caste system um, in the industry and you know, outsourcing, they'll, if it saves them money, they'll do it. So. Oh, Jesus, yes. Did you have some, you, you wanted to follow up Gene? No, I was just going to uh, ask, you've kind of like hinted to some of the changes that take, uh, have taken place in, in particular, in terms of organizing. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on what you think might have changed in the tech world? either internally or in the way that it's perceived by outsiders since you completed your uh, completed your book? Because it seems like you were writing at kind of the tail end of the golden age to a certain degree. I think uh, that's right. So yeah, I, I kind of wanted to get your take on how you think, how things have progressed since you completed your book. You know, I'm not sure what was the tipping point or what prompted the change. I think that you know, one thing I do talk about in the book is it, that really surprised me is how miserable people were, even the ones with these good jobs, you know, with, uh, you know, where the, they were catered lunches and dinners and, and all the benefits of working for a big tech company, like they tended to be pretty miserable. <laughs> and I think that just, I think that it was prompted by discussions that tech workers were having with each other about not working on products that had any social value you know, mm -hmm. working on those dating apps or whatever, and just feeling like, is this what my life is about? Uh, and, and you know, also people who, who worked in that industry, um, if they worked for maybe not one of the larger companies, but for startups, after a couple of times when your startup takes off and the workers don't get, even if they've got stock options or whatever, they don't strike it rich like the founders did, 
uh, that only has to happen so many times until people are like, hey, what's actually going on here? So I think it was just maybe the way that they'd been abused by the industry that drove uh, the new trend in organizing because uh, I think a lot of the, the, the golden, that, that golden era that you're talking about when the money was just flowing freely for anybody with an idea um, did not last forever. And I think the workers just kind of got fed up. It does sound like a rather soul destroying uh, uh, business. Another question I had uh, uh, was to what extent was uh, Silicon Valley ever meritocratic, at least in terms of people with technical abilities? And to what extent was it the same uh, sons and daughters of like, uh, American elites who were reaping all the benefits. To, to what extent was it just the younger generation of the American bourgeoisie who had money were going in with these startups and, you know, the myth of these programmers striking it rich was really not what was happening? I think it's about as meritocratic as Stanford's admission policy at any given time. So if you know, <laughs> if you know what, you know, what, what's going on on that score, then uh, you could say how, you could maybe quantify it. But just based on my own reporting and, because I, I really wanted to know the answer to this too, but based on my own reporting, I mean, the people that, that get their startups funded or get the top jobs, I mean, they're, they're uh, by and large, you know, pretty well off white kids from wealthy suburbs, if not, mm -hmm like right in the, if not Palo Alto, then someplace like that uh, around the country. And, you know, there is, uh, there is a bit of meritocratic selection. I mean, you do hear about, um, what was it? The, what was that company? Uh, I forget what the, the most recent one was. It was some amazing IPO where, you know, made a couple of billionaires overnight and, and uh, you know, they were, nobody's from nowhere. And that does happen. But it's the exception, you know, that proves the rule. And the rule is it's not any, I don't think it's any more meritocratic than, than other uh, big businesses in America. Um, certainly not um, in terms of upward mobility within the companies, you know, like there's that uh, caste system that Jason was talking about with third party contractors and stuff and people who, you know, toil away at the same jobs and, and never really hope to move up. I mean, th there's that going on within companies. And then when you look at the, the venture capital level, like they don't take chances on people with, um, you know, boring state college diplomas and things like that. Sure. That's a, uh, that's pretty gloomy and depressing. <laughs> Another gloomy, depressing thing that you talk about is, uh, and, and you mildly hear it today not as much as you did before was the learn how to code and how coding is has become not what people thought it was going to be as far as like this forever job that you could always get you know these kids are poor there's no way out we'll fucking teach bitches how to code i mean i was part of the reason i wrote the book is i was really kind of a believer in that because i was newspaper journalist for most of my career, you know, and at a certain point, you know, after the third or fourth newspaper shuts down, you start thinking like, is this, is this going to work when I'm middle aged, you know, and I was good with computers and I, you know, enjoyed building websites and things like that. So I thought that I could, maybe I could make that transition, you know, uh, certainly the people I knew that were working in tech compared to my newspaper friends were like making more money. Uh, they seem mm -hmm. to be happier in general, like less gripes. And I, I thought maybe I can make this work. But, you know, the first time I got a real tech job, I, I started to see that it wasn't everything that it was, um, you know, sold as. And as far as the learning to code, um, you know, you really have to think about why were they, why are they promoting that? so hard like what's with all these coding boot camps and, and like teaching everybody in every school in the country how to code they're trying to lower their labor costs i mean that first and foremost mm -hmm. that's what that campaign is about you know they don't want to pay programmers two hundred thousand dollars a year they want to pay them 35 or forty thousand dollars a year if they can get away with it and there's nothing that there's nothing that is that rarefied or difficult about 
coding that most people can't learn it. Uh, so, you know, if they if they really were to incorporate it in say K through 12 curriculum, then I think you know that they, they've gone a long way toward reaching that goal of of having cheap disposable programmers. I mean, eventually they want to automate the, the programming itself. Um, GitHub just released uh, this company that hosts a lot of software code, open source code. They just released a new sort of AI tool, tool that if you're typing um, programming, you know, it'll like finish your code block for you. At least make that's, it easy. Yeah, to make it easy. And, and they scanned, you know, their whole library of code to sort of build this this database that powers the, the coding assistant. Um, that's the kind of thing that the industry beyond learn to code is trying to promote because again, they, they want to lower their labor costs. That's always, whenever I hear people, you know, whenever I hear politicians talking about like, we need more people in this industry and more people in that industry, when they're like, we need more people training as plumbers. I'm always like, that's because you have to pay like a plumber a load of money to come and fix your toilet in the middle of the light and you want to pay less. You want more people doing these jobs. I think I think a lot of people miss this when we talk about the skilling up uh, agenda uh, it, because it's very often when it's pushed by business, it's about lowering the wages by increasing, you know, more engineers, cheaper engineers. Right. And, you know, that's that's something that uh, people miss a lot. But I kind of wanted to, to, to kind of ask something else, which is about, uh, it, it, I mean, it comes off something that we were talking about uh you know, last week uh, on our show when we were talking about, you know, people checking out in the checking out of work and, you know, getting out of the rat race and, you know, this lying down phenomena. And one of the things that came up was the one of the differences between China and the United States is that although, you know, by no means hegemonic, China has some kind of uh, national development mission that there is a significant degree of buy in to, you know, it, 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 there's like, you can kind of have a purpose in China or believe you have some kind of purpose in this big national development project. Whereas in the United States, that notion of some kind of collective national project is sort of absent. You know, America does not seem to have anything beyond glorifying getting rich. In what sense do these companies, uh, Google, the Googles, the Facebooks, to what extent do they sort of almost build a kind of like national project, like a, a company nationalism and a kind of national project idea, but for the employees of that uh, company? And to what extent does the fact that these companies have some kind of ideological mission, however superficial and fake it is, make them attractive? I think, you know, you see in in Silicon Valley, pretty much every single company, whether it's a startup or a big company, pretends that it's got some grand mission. I mean, Facebook talks about how, you know, we're on a mission to connect the world and, and shit like that. And, you know, how a lot of it is, is more concrete or more um, maybe believable or interesting than that kind of pap. However, they've all got to do it. And I think it goes, you know, to a, um, I don't know, it's, it's some kind of psychological phenomenon of people who work in that industry where they want to feel like they're the good capitalists. They're, they're more than, they're better than Wall Street. They're not like those people back East who just are interested in making money. You know, they're cool Californians who really want to make the world a better place. And that's all you hear, you know, we're make we're going to change the world, we're gonna make the world a better place, blah, 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 blah. And they all say it. It's like, with TikTok, uh, with TikTok, what does I mean, I TikTok's a Chinese company, Chinese, I mean, Chinese. Similar, with, a, with a similar kind of app, they're going to make the world a better place. Yeah, like, oh, I get you. Like, you to make the world a better place with all their money. Actually, what what is? Have you ever met some of the people who work for these like uh, Tinder, Grinder, those kind of yeah. things? I mean, yes. are, are they, do they do they believe that they make it? Because you know, I, I I gotta respect. You know, I just saw um, I just saw on Twitter I saw an ad for a workshop, um, and you know, no offense to anybody that might be participating in this or whatever, but it was um, it was OnlyFans, 
and they were doing a panel on you know sex work and um, and how and how to be like how to incorporate in your life and you know be you know have a healthy sort of outlook or whatever I, it was like it was not grinder but i think it sort of speaks to your point or to my point where they all do it so i think even if you went to you know uh like I'm trying to think of of what maybe no even like Bitcoin right like people who are into Bitcoin are and and those kind of startups around Bitcoin like even if they're just in it for making money they also talk about changing the world and making it a better place you they talk to, about, like world. that Spike Lee ad right oh my God if, if, look um, changing the world is built into your business plan in this world that we're speaking about because these are the people that have been put on the pedestal as the world changers. So when we think about the late Steve Jobs, whatever anyone that's watching this show thinks about him, let's be honest, that iPhone, even though a lot of us, again, watching this show know the history of the technology behind the iPhone being government funded, being pitched around for years, no one wanted to touch it. The capitalists come in and say, yeah, the government funded that, but if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't have the marketing that put that technology in your phone. And we, therefore, have made the world a better place. Look, you can take pictures in low light. <laughs> Still you waiting for a really for good your, light sensor. You can, you can take pictures for your only OnlyFans site with your iPhone. It's amazing. Yeah. Synergy, it's, it's synergy. To what extent do you think that culture because uh, that culture sounds pretty toxic especially if you <laughs> if you have to uh if you have to like pretend that you believe in the mission of like you know like i believe in only fans because i believe you know everybody should be able to engage in sex work whoever they are and we're connecting uh people around the world to what extent do you think that culture is infecting other areas of the economy where like now if you want to go work at freaking Walmart, you have to give them a whole song and dance about like, I'm really enthusiastic about working at Walmart and delivering people, you know, like you can't just go to a job anymore and say like, I would like a job because I like eating and I want to be left <laughs> alone. Is that uh, why uh, Walmart didn't hire me when I went and applied there many moons ago? I mean, I don't know where you can. I don't know where you can get a job and just be like, "Yeah, I, I want this job because it's got like discreet hours." You know, I don't have to take it home with me, and I don't have to think about it when I'm not at work. I mean, it seems like it's infected everything. Yeah, don't yeah, say that. Like, it's so funny. I was actually talking to my my girl about an intern, a very very enthusiastic uh, intern she has at at her job, and she was we were joking. She goes, the, the the poor person hasn't been tainted yet from. She's like, I can work long hours, and I can do this, and I can do that. When when I would work with these, the what I did, Corey was I went out with a bunch of marketing people from one of the companies. And we would go work these music festivals. And you know the type. At the airport, their laptop's in their lap. On the plane, their laptop's in their lap. Waiting for the Uber to pick us up to go to the Airbnb, their laptop's in their lap. Like they're constantly, constantly, constantly working. And that is so a part of the culture that if you're not working, then you're just not worth it. And they weren't making as much money as I thought they were making, considering the hours these people were putting in. I mean, it's so, uh, it's so, I guess, like in the, in the intro video there, I don't know what year it was from. It looked like it was from like 1988 or something, but the and news guy was really? like, he was like <laughs> going to sit down next to the computer. He's like, and some people worry that these things are going to take over our lives and maybe take our jobs. And it's like, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, eventually they, they do want to take all our jobs. Mm -hmm. That is part of the Silicon Valley agenda, if you can say there's such a thing. Um, but in the meantime, they've totally taken over our lives. Like who can get away from email, you know, social media, like that stuff, like the, the line between work and not work has has pretty much been obliterated if you're in any 
That's the best advice I got from Peter Thiel was that he hated email. Well, he's at a level he doesn't need to deal with it. He doesn't need to look at he's, these things. He said some of the most uh, time-wasting things you will ever have is responding to an email. And he <laughs> said that uh, phone calls work great and they're more efficient. And See, so I'm thinking smart because that's what I do. I don't I, – when, when I have to advise students, I tell them to speak to me on the phone because I'm not doing it by email because it takes ages. Because this is what he said. This is what he, I, I now talking to Corey is making me remember this fucking whole thing. Wait, wait, wait. What about your non disclosure agreement? Fuck them. What are they going to do? Screw <laughs> a broke man? Have fun with that shit. Blood from a turnip, Zuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I remember him saying the reason why he didn't like email was that there is this thing that people get nervous when they write the initial email. So you get a lot of, hey, I want to ask you a question. Then he's got to respond, well, what's the fucking question? Then they ask the question, then he's got to, you know, he didn't like that that back and forth. And he felt that with a phone call, you kind of get it all out. Well, there uh, you go. Life lessons from Peter Tail. Life lessons. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was very oh, right. That's what he, he, well, the he best was, one, when I, I well, watch. When I worked for Games Workshop, they, they had they had the best system of dealing with their employees, right? You would get paid, right? But you would get a 50% discount on everything in the shop and you could get toy soldier miniatures at cost. So everybody who worked for Games Workshop and one of the preconditions for working from Games Workshop is that you had to collect Games Workshop tabletop miniatures. So what happened? All the employees just ended up spending all their salary back at Games Workshop. So they uh, really got you with the ideological mission. That kind of feels like what Silicon Valley is. You know, everybody's like everything is like going around in a big circle into, uh, and the you know people are just getting uh, getting squeezed for everything they they have. They're reinventing like, company stores for sure. Yeah, they, exactly. And they feed you so you never leave. No. No. I'm pretty sure that uh, you know Amazon eventually is going to try to make their own their own currencies like Bitcoin or something, so that you can they'll give you enough that you can spend it there at the oh store. My God. Yeah. As, as as we're wrapping up this first hour, I do want to ask this to Corey, and I'm surprised that Brother Pascal hasn't brought this up. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at you. Uh, <laughs> there was a story that came out of a small independent Nevada newspaper that there were tech companies trying to move into some of the vast nothing that is Nevada and create kind of company towns, have their own school system, have their own currency, have their own police force. Did you see that story at all when it hit? Yeah. I think I saw that, but I didn't. I didn't quite dig into it. So if you know more about it, I'd be curious. I'm not surprised. I mean, there are um, there are efforts. Uh, they some of the more extreme sort of tech libertarians have tried to build similar things in um, South America, uh, and on on the sea. That's I mean that's another example. Peter Thiel has funded something called the Sea Studying Institute, which um, they made fun of on the Silicon Valley show, where they had a platform out at sea that was supposedly lawless and all the all the rules written by the corporation um that's that's the kind yeah. of idea that really gets their juices going you know so i i'm not i won't be surprised if some jurisdictions actually uh let that happen it's already happening like i wanted to do a story uh it got nixed unfortunately but uh when i was living in india i wanted to do a story because there are private cities being established there, and I think that that precedent will be used to um, to do the same thing in the U.S., for instance, because uh, people have absorbed this idea that the government can't do anything right and companies are more efficient, so why not let the company hire the police force and deal with the sewers and stuff? It just Robocop. usually, yeah, basically, <laughs> basically. But that goes back to what we were saying about how, um, 
you know, these Silicon Valley leaders look at science fiction and see themselves as the villains and think it's desirable. It's really, it's, it is it's really perverse in the sense that so much of what was envisaged as a dystopia in the past is now being flipped around and turned into and repackaged as the new utopia. But you scratch beneath the surface and it is like, it's uh, as uh, LME said, it's neo-feudalism. I mean, that's, that's what it comes down to. I mean, they're even uh, appointing their own court uh, um, political scientists and spokesmen to, to articulate an ideology for this new order. You combine that with the fact that, as Corey says, a lot of them are literally fascists. And what are we really talking about here? Yeah, I think it's pretty scary. I mean, I try not to think about it as much as when I was working on the book because it does bum me out. And that is one piece of feedback I did hear a lot is people said they found it depressing. But I tried to make it funny so that the depressing parts would go down a little smoother. It was hilarious. And Pascal, you're talking about fascism with the Black Lives Matter sticker on it. That's Great. rainbow colored. So <laughs> rainbow colored BLM fascism. I don't uh, uh, BLM boot. <laughs> if someone Remember can make the a name for that. The BLM boot. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 rainbow colored BLM fascism for the for the new millennium. For the for the new generation. That's what it is. Woke woke fascism. Woke fascism. Oh, woke fascism, dude. If you're not hip with woke fascism, then what are you even doing, man? He's you not doing it right. Jeez. <laughs> Cole, you just bummed us all out. Yeah, Everybody sorry. I have that effect. Down. I have that effect. No, no. We appreciate it. <laughs> I think this shit is fucking hilarious. Again, being in that world, and and there's there's wherever you're listening or watching the the show, there's links in the description to to Corey's website as well as uh, buy links to to Corey's book. Yeah, uh, buy Corey's book honestly. But uh, and uh, there's a book version. I've read the book version. I've also listened to the listening version, which has Corey reading it to you. Oh, he's reading it. Yeah, I did the whole yeah. thing. It took like. Uh, it took like three days in a little booth to read book but is it, is it because is it because you found out that the guy that usually reads it is a is a prisoner is locked up is that why <laughs> no nothing so socially conscious uh it's because i got paid a little extra nice but you know because of the way publishing works i never actually saw that money it's just taken out of my uh advance you know what i what i owe the publisher so i didn't it, i didn't it, know it, it, that surely guy. it's not as well, everybody should buy Corey's book because it's really worth it. And uh, is it uh, surely it can't be as bad as academic publishing, where like you write a book and you never see any money for it? You must. I mean, I will. The book did not sell well enough that I'm getting royalty checks, but I did get a decent amount of money when I signed. So, but it, it was better than academic publishing. My wife is having her first book come out on an academic press pretty soon. And I, I don't think it's going to change our lives financially speaking. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, well, thank you so much, Corey. You'll be joining us for the second half. Yeah, sure. We can uh, tell we the get, second half. We, I want to get more into Corey's time in India and actually Bill Gates, his role in India and, and what's going on there. Um, and we'll tell more hilariously funny horror stories of free lunches, micro kitchens, espresso machines on every floor. What else? Only fans. Only, Only fans. <laughs> get free. I wonder what the bonuses are if you work at OnlyFans. A, a hoodie that says only fans on it so you can walk around and people go oh shit you work at only fans you go yeah that's what you do yeah i suppose so um well everybody should remember to like and subscribe like subscribe hit the bell become a patron if you like tell so your friends about the podcast so for for those of you that are not patrons, uh, we will be uh, hosting the patron only half on Facebook. Uh, so if you go to the This Is Revolution Facebook page, there is an invite. Uh, we are charging admission for it. But not for patrons. 
No, of course not. For or Patriots, just go to the Patreon. The link's up. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're still having some weird technical issues. So while we're having these weird technical issues, I figured, well, let me try to open it up to more people that don't want to pay every month but just want to talk shit with us for the next uh, 30 to minutes to an hour. So if that's the case, go to Facebook. There's an event up there. Sign up, and you can uh, get in the room with us while we talk some shit. And also, we have hats, don't we? Even though we these guys hats, don't have hats. Fucker. In the great words, we've got hats. We've got we've got hoodies. We've got we jock got straps. Merch. We've got merch. Watch it. See see this, Corey. We're doing our hustle here on this is revolution. I was looking at some of the merch. It's pretty nice. Thank you. Corey likes our merch. Corey likes I'll our tell merch. You, I'll tell you off air uh, how funny it is that you said that about the person that designs it. <laughs> um, LME needs another TA. This is Revolution t shirt. There you go. So you go to the website, this is Revolution, and on the site, you go down and bam! We got Look multiple designs design of hoodie and shirt. I just got a new shirt myself for my girl. We got hats. The embroidery is actually hat. on I'm, with the hats. I'm going to buy a hat. It's hell of on point. Uh, I got this shirt right here. That's the best store. one. That's the best hat. That's the best hat. Uh, there's going to be some new stuff getting dropped um, design wise, I would say, in the next few weeks. Um, originally, when we did this, uh, we came up with probably, what, like eight, nine designs. And uh, there's definitely some cool, some cool stuff that when we came up with the original designs, we didn't have all the Pascal sayings. So we're going to have to add the Pascal sayings and some of the designs. What's uh, Pascal's number one saying? Mau Mau. One, one more time for people in the back. Mau Mau is just what he is. So tomorrow, the the Mau the Mau Hour with Pascal Robert. For patrons only, the Mau Mau Hour for Pascal Robert. Again, if you guys don't want to be patrons, but you want to watch it, you go to the Facebook. I'll have an invite up. Again, they'll be yes, the fat back and biscuits is my is my saying. I should have it trademarked. Uh, should we do a fat back and biscuits shirt? Yeah, so that's so a good idea. Yeah, fat back and biscuits shirt. Yeah, we need oh, a fat back. No, and no, biscuits. Sure. What we should, you know, what we should do, we should do a, we should do a, um, a, a Twitter poll to see which of Pascal's uh, sayings should be put on the next T-shirt. You, you know what you know what like I would really like to do too is if we could have autographed copies of the books. So I actually did I tried to buy the digital copy and I fucked up and bought the actual hard copy of your book, Corey. Oh, that's that's cool. So uh someone said we should do a, a cartoon of Tiny E. C. Holtz and Ibrahim Candy eating fat back and biscuits. <laughs> I don't know if you could walk around with that as a white person. <laughs> Jason is the music. <laughs> The picture in my head is of some very well-intentioned white person wearing that shirt and then uh, <laughs> just in the wrong space with it. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, that's not a good idea because uh, imagine that white person wearing that shirt, again, well-intentioned, and then crossing paths was like a hotep. Yeah, that, that wouldn't end well. I can't have that if on my conscience. If Umar Johnson and his friends find Umar it, Johnson uh, sees Gene wearing a fat back and biscuits t shirt with a town he's coach. I, I am not. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. That sounds awful. Somebody well, said. let's get let's get to. Yeah, that's that's what's that's going to be the Mau Mau right there. You're yeah. going to get yourself Mau Mau with the This is Revolution <laughs> swag. You know what? You know how you know your show is over when Van Jones is just fucking shitting all over you because you had Van Jones might be the subject of the Mama Hour. 
Oh yeah, Mau 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 Jones. Yes, Paul can Fat, wear that. Sat back in flaky Fuck biscuits. Up. Somebody say Paul yeah, Jones with the fat back and flaky biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> That's like the meanest shit. Like, I think that shit would be funny, and I would hella do that. And then you start getting all these messages from people like, I had your shirt on, some fucking guy called me a racist. And I had to explain to him that, no, 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 I have black friends. I watch black people. <laughs> I love the NBA. <laughs> Okay, let's get to the fun hop, guys. Let's okay. get to the after hours. Okay, I love you guys, and we are out. <laughs>